But lots of my friends were saying that that particular show sparked their interest in coming to Ghana as well. So I'm like, great. I don't care where y'all get the information from. Even though I've been trying to tell y'all since 2006 that this place is paradise. Right. However you get it, just get it and come. So you can see for yourself, you know, because the media is going to portray how they want things to be shown and seen. But you come for yourself and you experience for yourself. It's a whole different thing because Mm -hmm. you cannot deny what you see with your own eyes and what you feel Mm -hmm. with your own spirit. Right. Somebody can show you anything on TV. Like we can create anything on a screen. Like there's editing apps that we can put on our phones now to make things look better or worse. But when you see it with your own eyes, that's it. That's the truth. So I am hoping that more and more people open their eyes and become more aware to the beauty of Africa. Not just Ghana, all of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Rwanda. You know, when people think of Rwanda, all they think about is war, right? And fighting. But when we look at the statistics, Rwanda is one of the fastest growing African countries. They have one of the best economies. So there's so much misinformation out there. And so it's our job, those of us who are informed, to educate others and to tell others, hey, instead of booking that flight to Paris, why don't you book a flight to West Africa or East Africa, South Africa, North Africa? It's so diverse. And come and learn about the beauty of Mother Africa. Malik's first job podcast here to answer any questions that y'all ask. Financial literacy and resources. Parents and young people becoming bosses. CEOs, future leaders, entrepreneurs. Conferences and boardrooms getting sponsors secured. If you want generational wealth, Brooklyn's own Curran Phillip with information to help. Malik's first job podcast. Malik, Malik podcast. Brooklyn's own Curran Phillip. Curran, Curran Phillip. Malik's first job podcast, podcast, pod, podcast, Brooklyn's own, Kerwin Phillip, Generational Wealth. 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 All right, good morning, everyone. How you doing? This is Kerwin Phillip with another episode of the Malik's First Job Podcast, where we speak about leadership, entrepreneurship, and financial literacy for parents and teens. Um, today, we're going to do, we're going to talk, have like a slightly different conversation. Um, we have our sister, Miss Ama Indy. Uh, she recently made the uh, the trip. I mean, not just the trip, but she uh, recently, her and her family repatriated back to uh, to Africa. She currently lives in Ghana, and we're going to have a conversation about you know like her motivation for making the move and how she planned on that move. Because a lot of African Americans today are thinking about uh, making that move to Ghana, and many don't know the steps to take in order to make that happen. So we're going to ask our sister to kind of share. Her experience, some information that could be helpful for others that may want to make that same journey. So, how are you doing this morning, sister? I'm wonderful, thank you. How are you, yeah. brother? I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. And as awesome. I know we saw earlier that uh, your husband uh, Kujo will be popping in in and out. I know he's doing some work <laughs> this morning, yes. so you know we look forward to speaking with him as well. Just you know, kind of get his take on the whole yes. process, All right? So, um, so how has it been so far? It's been wonderful. Um, Every day has just been sweeter and sweeter and sweeter. Um, It is a beautiful thing to have a sense of freedom. I, I have worked since I was 13, 14 years old. I was one of those ones who went and got the pink slip of paper from my guidance counselor in high school so that I could work before the legal age. So I have, I've just worked and worked and worked and worked and worked. So it's been really, really nice to be here and to have time to focus on my own business, my own goals, what I want to do moving forward. It's been beautiful spending nonstop time with my children. Um, I was thinking last night, last summer, I worked so much and I was away from home so much. I felt like a foreigner in my own home. And I had to take a step back from working because the money was beautiful, (laughs) but I was having to ask questions about my own children. And to (laughs) me, 
that was not right. And so right. Um, this this past week, because today is Wednesday, so we've only been here since Sunday night. But this okay. past week and three days has been so beautiful because there's not a moment that I have missed with my children or my husband. We've been, I mean, just like thick as thieves. You know, if he runs to the store, we're going to the store with him. And he, if he runs into town, we're all going into town. And I have really, really enjoyed that because the, the rat race has kept us separated and kept us, you know, working so much and focused on other people's dreams and goals that we really haven't had a chance to truly sit down and focus on our own outside of planning to come here. <laughs> so, right, 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 yes. right, right. So, so let's kind of go back. So what was the initial motivation to make you want to make that move to, uh, to Ghana? <laughs> Oh, that's a loaded question. Um, <laughs> I can't say it was one thing. Um, okay. I think that I have always felt a pull and a drive to be connected to my culture. As a woman of African descent living in America, I always felt, I don't want to say out of place, but I always knew, I'm like, okay, I know I have native ancestry and I connect to that, but I also missed the African connection. I missed it. Even as, you know, even growing up, um, I had influences, I had family members who were very connected to Africa and they would always try to educate me, keep me informed. And it wasn't until graduate school, I, I graduated from the Samuel DeWitt Proctor School of Theology in 2006. And when I graduated, uh, I, I think it was maybe two or three days after graduation, I took the journey to Ghana for the first time. And I was nervous, I was worried, I had never been separated from my family before and at this time I was married to my first husband and so um and, and that that's a whole nother conversation because he was not totally on board with okay. um me traveling to Ghana without him but uh I did come with a group of seminarians I came with um my New Testament professor who takes people back and forth to Ghana multiple times a year and so that was kind of the only saving grace. It was like, okay, you're going with this person that I know and trust, and I know you'll be right. okay. And even, even my church family, they were really worried about me coming to Ghana, you know, <laughs> because they were like, well, you're not going on missionary work. What are you going for? But right. we came to learn. We came to connect to spirit, connect to um, culture, heritage, all the things. You know, the trip right. was not just to come and be missionaries the trip was multifaceted so right i came to ghana my first week here was a struggle um it was very very hard i was ready to go home i'm an only child so i get homesick very easily i was calling home every day i had and we had to walk very far to use the payphone at the time and it was just really really hard by right. the second week I was like, oh, this is where I belong. <laughs> it, it, okay. it was such a major transition. I went from I don't want to be here to I don't want to leave ever. And wow. I've never really felt that way around anyone other than my close family members. But I felt so at home here by my second week. And I had met some beautiful people. I met people who look like me. And when I say look like me, I don't just mean of African descent. I mean, I met people with the same nose, same cheek structure, same complexion. I met a family where the grandmother looked at me, looked at her children and her grandchildren and, and made me come and sit with her because she knew that some kind of way I was related to them. I had wow. never met this woman before in my life. I did not speak right. the same language, but because of my facial features, because of my height, because of the gap in my teeth, she was like, you belong to us. And so, <laughs> you know, things like that were happening. And I was like, wow, you know, this is, this is a beautiful, beautiful thing. So by the time I was leaving, I was here, my first trip, I was here for 21 days. So by the 18th or 19th day, I was starting to look for jobs. 
And I was calling home and telling my ex-husband, hey, look, I might not come home, <laughs> you know, and he was not happy at all. <laughs> he said, that's why I didn't want you to go. <laughs> but I came home. I came yeah. home and I was miserable. I was depressed. Um, I spent like a month in bed. I stopped going to church for a little bit. And this was a big deal because I was a youth minister on staff at a wow. church during this time. And I was also working for the Baptist General Convention. And I just could not get myself together. I, I longed to be back. I miss everything about this place. The people, the culture, the food, even the heat. <laughs> I missed it all. And I just was not happy in the States anymore. Everything about me changed. I changed my hair. I used to um, relax my hair. And I, you know, I took pride in my pretty long, straight hair. But after coming back, and even while I was in Ghana, I said, I don't want to straighten my hair anymore. I just want to wear my hair natural. And, you know, which was very, very different for me. Um, so coming home, everything changed. The way I shopped, the way I purchased food. All the things changed and I turned into a completely different person. And and I think really it was more me returning to who I authentically was, um, because for many years I was doing what I, what I thought I was supposed to do. I was a good church girl. I was ministering in a church. I was following, you know, my ex-husband's dreams, doing doing all the things that I thought I was supposed to do. And it wasn't until I was here in Ghana that I realized that's not what I want to do. You know, I, I, um, coming here, I visited a birthing center and I remember standing in the birthing center saying, this is what I want to do. I want to help women have their babies. Now I didn't have any children at this time. I, you know, at, at, honestly, I was deemed infertile at that time because of some health complications I was having. I was very overweight. I did not take very good care of my body. I would just eat any and everything. And um, the doctors told me I was infertile. I couldn't have children. But being in the birthing center, I was like, whether I have children or not, I want to be the person that helps in this birthing center. And at that time, I didn't know what a doula was. I had never heard the word doula, but I did know what a midwife was. And okay. so, you know, I talked to the midwives, I talked to the volunteers from the community. And I was mm -hmm. like, when I come back to Ghana, this is what, this is, this is it right here. This is my life. Okay. This is what I'm going to do. So that was 2006, right? Okay. Three, you know, I come home, depressed, sad. I want to go back. I'm working, doing all the things, going through the motions, trying to function at church and all these right. things start happening. Um, one of my relatives was murdered during a hate crime. And that really, I think, was one of the main catalysts to me wanting to leave America um, because my cousin was 18 years old, about to go to college on a full scholarship to play football. Um, he was an amazing young man. And for someone to take his life just because of the color of his skin, I just, you know, we see these things, we hear about these things, but when it happened to my family, right. it really did something to me. Um, it affected me in regards to my spirituality and religion um, because people kept saying it was God's will. And I just could not accept that it was God's will for right. someone to murder my family member just so other children could come to the Lord. That made no sense to me. Now, I have yeah. I have a master's degree in theology. I've mm -hmm. been in church all my life. I am right. one of the most prayerful people you will ever meet because I will pray, honey, okay? I will get a prayer <laughs> through. But to hear that, it made me really stop and say that there are some things in the church I just can't get with. <laughs> like, yeah. I love yeah. God. I love the people of God. I love to serve the people of God. But I cannot accept that type of teaching and that type of, you know, ideology that God has yes. to kill a child in order for other children to come. So that's, you know, we, we can have another podcast about that because right. I can talk right. about right. religion all day. But um, so, so, so that was something that really, you know, sparked my flame even more to want to come back. 
because I'm like, I, I, don't, I wouldn't have that problem in Ghana. Nobody is trying to harm me for the color of my skin here. If anything, I am celebrated here because I am a daughter returning to Mother Africa. So, um, you know, that happened. And then my first marriage dissolved. And when, when my first marriage dissolved, I was thought of, I said, I'm free now. I can do whatever I want. I can go to Ghana. Um, but I didn't have a plan, right? I did not have a concrete plan at the time. I just had a dream. Right. So in 2009, I came back. When I came back in 2009, I really, really started to develop my dream and what I wanted my life to look like here. And I started to ask more questions about living here and getting dual citizenship and working here and becoming a birth worker and working in the community because I didn't want to just come here and be a burden to Ghana. I wanted to come here and contribute to this country that I was falling in love with so quickly. So from 2009 on, it's just, it's really just been on. <laughs> you know, I was every day in my mind, what can I do to get back to Ghana? You know, what can I do? What, what steps can I take? Who do I need to talk to, you know? And, and we had, um, my husband and I have a dear friend who moved here in, I think he moved in 2011. And so I have been picking his brain, I mean, constantly just, if he posts something on Facebook, I'm asking, okay, brother, well, what about this? And, you know, I'm, I'm just letting him know, continue to share your journey because it is encouraging us. And I really had no idea when we would make it here. You know, I, I just knew that it was going to happen. You know, I just knew that if we continue to work, if we continue to speak it, if we continue to talk about it, write it down, if we continue to save our funds and put things aside and, you know, certain things we couldn't do anymore. We had to sacrifice, you know, like for, for a couple of years, my husband was coming here every four months to meet people, to talk to people, to build our business, because, you know, we don't want to just come and be isolated from the community. Our goal has always been to be a part of the community. And so all of these things were, were working together so that this moment can happen, you know, and it's, it's very overwhelming. You know, I get very emotional. I cry easily. <laughs> I think I cry every day, not sadness. I cry um, because I live in Ghana now, you know, <laughs> and this is what I talked about and this is what I work towards. And I'm here in my home with my children and it is amazing. It is absolutely amazing. So I hope I answered your question. <laughs> <laughs> you did, you did. And it gave you a little extra tool. A little extra tool. All right. I've just been talking, brother, because I can talk now. <laughs> <laughs> it's all good. So so let's kind of go back. You said that um, you know, like you mentioned that you had a vision, you know, you had I guess you had the faith that it's gonna happen one day, right? Yes. So and you said you had to put a plan together. So yes. what was that plan? Like, how did you put the game plan together to eventually make that move? So it was uh, it was definitely a process. Okay. Um, like I said, we have we have a friend who came from the states in two thousand eleven, um, and through him, we met another man from Virginia, of all places, okay. from Virginia Beach. Okay who moved here. I can't remember what year um, brother, this particular brother moved here, but we just started to ask them questions about how best to prepare to come. And so they were just giving us guidance, um, of course, save money, which mm -hmm. I have met people who came here with nothing. I've met families who came just with their suitcases and a dream, and they are living very well. And if you have that type of faith, I say, go for it. Me on the other hand, you know, I like to I like to be a little bit more prepared, especially with my children and bringing another life, you know, into this world. So um, one of the first things we did was talk about how we would earn income while here. And um, one of one of the most valuable pieces of advice was you don't necessarily have to provide a need for the people, but if you can give the people what they want you will always make money, right? Okay. 
And so I thought, you know, I love to bake. I love to cook, right? That's mm -hmm. a, a part of what I was called and created to do. I love baking treats. Who does not like chocolate chip cookies and brownies? So, you know, that was one of our first ideas. Hey, we're going to sell the baked goods. And then we thought about the heat. And then we thought about maybe ice cream. So initially, we were like, okay, we're going to find an ice cream wholesaler. And then one day, I remembered that my grandmother used to make homemade ice cream. And then my yeah. husband remembered his grandma used to make homemade ice cream. So right. we decided that we were going to make homemade ice cream, milkshakes, and smoothies. And we've mm -hmm. also always wanted to have a raw juice bar. Okay. This place is plentiful with vegetables and fruits. And when I say they are delicious, like the, the pineapple here, we call it sugar loaf. Oh, my gosh. I've never had pineapple like that in my life. So, you know, that that was one of the things that was, was first and foremost. How are we going to earn income while also doing what we love to do? Because we didn't want to come here and be miserable working all the time, having someone else look after our children. No, we wanted our children to be involved in what we were doing so that we would build a legacy for them. And so, you know, my children love helping me create in the kitchen. They're always like, let's, let's make this, mommy, or let's make that. And so the ice cream, smoothie, milkshakes, cookies, brownies, and whatever else, you know, baking bread, all of those things um, we thought would be a great idea. And so that was one step. Another step was looking for where we wanted to live. Um, uh, Ghana is vast, right? Ghana has multiple regions, kind of like, you know, in Virginia, where we have different counties and cities. Right. Ghana has different regions. Each region you go to is unique. You can go from the north to the south and think you're in a completely different country, kind of like Northern Virginia <laughs> and right. Tidewater, okay? Right. So um, we started to look at where we wanted to be. I love the water. You know, I've always wanted to be living near the water. Uh, but living near the beach, it's very expensive. And that's not what we wanted. We did not want to come here and have to work ourselves to death in order to just enjoy our lives. So um, my husband researched and we found this particular area. It's called the Eastern Region. Okay. And the Volta River is literally right across the road from where we live. The Volta okay. River is absolutely beautiful. And then a few miles down the road is the Volta region where the Volta Lake is. And the lake is even larger than the river. And so when my husband was choosing where we would live, he, he thought, hey, my wife really likes the water. So why not pick this place? And so this is how we chose, you know, where we we're going to live, the eastern region. It's very affordable to live here. Um, yes. We live in a four bedroom house, four bedroom, three bathroom house, and we pay rent per year. Our rent for two years was $2,400 for wow. two years total wow. for a four bedroom, three bathroom house. And we live on a compound. I'm, I'm, and I need to ask him how many acres, but we have pineapple, corn, cassava, Papa, palm nut, and so many other fruits and vegetables growing right in our front yard and in our side yard for $2,400 for two years total. There is no US, way you can get that in the States. <laughs> right. So just to clarify, that's $2,400 US. Yes, $2,400 US for two years. Yes. Wow. Now, if, if, we would have moved to the city, like Accra. Mm -hmm. um, our rent would have probably been $2,400 a month because okay. there are homes, there are beautiful, I mean, like mansions with pools and jacuzzis and Accra. Um, mm -hmm. And you can, you can really live however you want to live. But we right. decided we didn't want to be in the city because, again, right. that's not the life we want. We could have stayed in the States for that life. We prefer right. to be out more in the country, um, but still close to the water, still close to a very lively and busy area. 
Um, there are uh, two towns that surround us. And so whenever we need anything, we can just go to either town and get what we need. And then if we need something that the town doesn't provide, we can take the two hour drive to Accra, which is kind of like, I compare it to going from Richmond to DC. Lots of traffic, okay. <laughs> okay. lots of police, you know, on the roads, making sure everybody's behaving themselves. But once you okay. get to DC, you have a great time, but you know, you may not want to necessarily stay there. You want to go back home. So that's yeah. how I feel about Accra. We love Accra. It's a beautiful city, lots to do there. Um, but we love this country life. We love where we live. We really do. Right. It's beautiful. Yes. Beautiful, beautiful. Um, so those are the main things. Finding what you want to do, finding somewhere to live. Um, and it's not hard, you know, it's it's once you get to know people and and you can you can utilize social media. It doesn't have to be someone that you have met. You just have to use your discernment to make sure you trust that person to help you conduct business. One thing that we try to do is we try to always have our Ghanaian family members with us when we are conducting business. Because the perception is because we're coming from the States, we have unlimited resources. But that is not the case because we have hungry children. So our resources get exhausted quickly. So we keep our Ghanaian family with us so that, you know, that will help us negotiate and they will explain to them, hey, these are children of Africa returning home. Don't try to take advantage of them because you think they have money. We're going to treat them as if they are local people. They're not foreigners. Like we have a friend who we call our brother. He does not play about that. He will make sure to inform everyone. We are not foreigners. We are family members returning home. And that is how he introduces us to everyone. And he expects everyone to respect us in that manner. And so far, we have not had any issues. It's been a beautiful process. Everyone has welcomed us. It has even, even the police, you know, like the police are like Rasta, you know, Empress, <laughs> Queen. You know, it's so different because when, you know, when you get pulled over by the police in the States, there's mm -hmm. fear and there's anxiety. Right. Here, you know, when you're passing through different towns, the police, they're there to, to maintain order. But they're, mm -hmm. you know, they're friendly. They know everybody in the town. And so when we pull up to them, and I've had to learn how to adjust to this, because in my mind, they still the police. But right. when they come to the car, they're so happy to see us. And they always want to talk to our children. They will mm -hmm. ask us to roll the windows down so that they can speak to our boys. They will, you know, it's just such a different energy here. It is very, very different. And so now when we pull up to the police, I'm like, hey, bro, you know, it's just very, very, I would never do that to a cop in the States. I would not lift my hands like this to a cop mm -hmm. in the States because we all know what could potentially happen, even if my energy is positive. But yeah. here it is just very, very different. And so it's beautiful that my children get to even see that. Because my 10 year old, you know, he is very aware of some of the things that have happened in, in the right. United States, with the police and our people. So for him to see not only officers who are friendly, but officers who look like him and are friendly, it is really, really beautiful for me. So, yeah. yes. Beautiful, beautiful. So today is a great day to start your own podcast. Whether you're looking for a new marketing channel, have a message you want to share with the world, or just think it would be fun to have your own talk show, podcasting is an easy, inexpensive, and fun way to expand your reach online. Buzzsprout is hands down the easiest and best way to launch, promote, and track your podcast. Your show can be online and listed in all the major podcast directories, like Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google products and more within minutes of finishing your recording. Podcasting isn't hard when you have the right partners and the team at Buzzsprout is passionate about helping you succeed. Join over 100,000 podcasters already using Buzzsprout to get their message out to the world. Let's create something together. Follow the link in the show notes and let Buzzsprout know that we sent you and that will get you a $20 Amazon gift card if you sign up for a paid plan and help support our show. Thank you very much. 
and let's be great podcasting together. Peace. Malik's first job, Financial Principles for Teens, is an excellent resource to get your children started on understanding the basics of financial literacy. This book, which is set in Brownville, Brooklyn, about a young man who gets his first job and then shortly thereafter sits down with his dad to learn how to manage his money. There are several topics that are covered within this work, such as paying yourself first, disciplining your spending, knowing the difference between an asset and a liability, creating multiple sources of income, as well as the importance of being charitable. So again, if you want to get your children started on understanding finance and becoming responsible adults, we highly recommend that you purchase the book, Malik's First Job, Financial Principles for Teens. So please visit maliksfirstjob.com to get more information. Peace. So, so what has been like the, um, I guess the feedback you got from family members for you making this trip? So it's been, it's been very mixed, right? So a lot of my family, not a lot, all my family, they, they've been aware of my dreams to come to Ghana ever since my first visit, you know, because when I first came home, I was like, look, I'm going back. I'm sick of it here, you know? And so, um, and it's so funny because they they were shocked that I stayed in the States as long as I did. They, you know, every every year, they're like, we know you're about to leave this year. Every shooting, every, you know, story about racism, everything, especially when Trump was elected. Oh, God. They would say, oh, oh we know she leaving now. She out of here now. But, you know, it wasn't time yet. It wasn't time yet. Um, and so when I finally announced in March that we were leaving in October, everyone was not surprised. They were all like, okay, yeah, we know you're leaving. Um, my mom was, uh, she, I, I, I'm trying to think of the right word to describe because I don't want to say that she was not supportive because that's not, that's not what it was. My mom has always been my biggest fan, always been my greatest supporter. But I know it was very, very hard for her to adjust to the idea that it was actually happening. Because prior to March, we were just talking about it, right? Just planning. But in March, I was like, okay, mom, I am leaving, like for real. And so it was very, very difficult for her. She was very emotional. And then when she found out I was pregnant, it was very, very hard for her because she has been the primary caretaker of my, my younger children since they were born. My sons have never been to daycare. They have never been to public school. We have only homeschooled them. And my mom is the only person who has ever taken care of them Aside from a few, a few family members here and there, but it has always been my mother from day one since they were born. So for her to know that a new baby is coming and she will not be as active and present, I know that it was very, very hard for her. And so it was hard for me, too, you know, because like I said, I'm an only child. My dad passed away two years ago. And so it's just me and mom and my children and my husband, you know, and so it was hard. It was very difficult. But as time went on, you know, she really, really started to lean into the idea that, wow, I have a daughter that's going to Africa. And I will never forget one day she was on the phone with her friend and I heard her talking about me going to Ghana and I cried so hard because she sounded so proud. Like, I was like, is she talking about me? I could have believe she was like, okay. But it was just so beautiful to hear her say, you know, this is her dream. She's been talking about this for years and she's finally making it happen. And all the things that she was saying was so beautiful for me to hear because I know, I knew that she was happy for me, but to hear her say those things to her friend, it was just, it, it took a lot of guilt off of me because I felt bad because I'm like, I'm leaving my mama. What if something happens to my mom while I'm away? Because right. it's just her now. You know, my dad is not here to look after her. Um, but 
I have some great family members and friends who are making sure to look after my mom. Um, some of my older aunts and uncles were a little worried about me moving to Ghana. And they even expressed, you know, like, well, where are you going to live? What is it like? You know, because their only, their only visual of Africa is poverty. Right. You know, the media has done a disservice in telling us and showing us just one side. Now, what's crazy is there's so much poverty in the United States. I don't understand why people only focus on poverty in Africa. When right. you can drive from the city to city in the States and see homeless people lined up on the street, you can see displaced people, you know, searching for food, but mm -hmm. we only focus on poverty in Africa. So right. that's, again, that's a whole nother podcast, right? right? But my uncle in particular was very, very concerned, right? He had all these questions. And I was telling him, I'm like, uncle, I promise everything is fine. You know, I'm, I told him I was going to show him pictures of where we were going to be living. In the meantime, there was some type of documentary or news show. I don't know if it was Good Morning America, but some news anchor came to Ghana and had like a three part series here. And my uncle saw it and he called my mom and said, oh, she's going to be fine. I just saw the show and, and everything is going to be great. You know, and so I just kind of laughed. I'm like, I have been telling you all this time that Ghana is beautiful and like the islands and you got to hear it from the news anchor. But OK, I, I don't even care. However you get the information, I'm just glad that you have it now. You know, so and I haven't even watched whatever show it was. Um mm -hmm. But it aired, I guess, last month or, or maybe in August. But okay. lots of my friends were saying that that particular show sparked their interest in coming to Ghana as well. So I'm like, great. I don't care where y'all get the information from. Even though I've been trying to tell y'all since 2006 that this place is paradise. Right. However you get it, just get it and come. So you can see for yourself, you know, because mm -hmm. the media is going to portray how they want things to be shown and seen right. but you come for yourself and you experience for yourself it's a whole different thing because you cannot deny what you see with your own eyes and what you feel with your own spirit right somebody can show you anything on tv like we can create anything on a screen like there's yeah. editing apps that we can put on our phones now to make things look better or worse but when you right. see it with your own eyes, that's it. That's the truth. Right. So I am hoping that more and more people open their eyes and become more aware to the beauty of Africa. Not just Ghana, all of Africa, Ethiopia, Eritrea, Sudan, Rwanda. You know, when people think of Rwanda, all they think about is war, right, and right. fighting. But when we look at the statistics, Rwanda is one of the fastest growing African countries. They have one of the best economies. So there's so much misinformation out there. And so it's our job, those of us who are informed, to educate others and to tell others, hey, instead of booking that flight to Paris, why don't you book a flight to West Africa or East Africa, South Africa, North Africa is so diverse and come and learn about the beauty of Mother Africa. So that's my little commercial for uh, <laughs> coming to visit Africa. <laughs> yeah. All right. So, so, um, so we spoke about other family members. How about your children? How do they take? How do they, you know, make the adjustment and embrace the uh, the concept of moving to to Africa? So my ten year old struggled a lot. He is very close to my mom, as I was mentioning, and I think he just came out of the room just as I was okay. talking about him, which is funny. But um, he struggled because he's close to my mom, and he, he is our, we call him our asafo. Asafo means security or watch person. Okay. So he is our bodyguard, right? So he looks after everybody, protects everybody, and he's very protective of my mom and myself. And when we told him that we were leaving, he said he wasn't coming, that he was staying with my mama because there was nobody at the house to look after her and make sure she was okay. 
And he continued to say that almost up until it was time to leave. You know, we had to explain to him that we can't leave you in the States. You have to come with us. So I told him, I said, your best bet is to figure out a way to get your Gigi to come and live with us in Ghana because we are leaving, you know. And so, okay, boys. Yeah, everybody's out of the room now making noise. Um, And so, yeah, so he he was just determined. He's like, no, I'm not going with y'all. Honey, are you coming in here? Okay, when you can. Um, So he, he was just really, really worried. I think Mm -hmm. that um, he has dealt with homesickness more so than the four-year-old. Our Mm four-year-old is just happy to be anywhere. (laughs) So Mm -hmm. if there's food, he's okay. (laughs) If there are toys, he's fine. But the Mm -hmm. 10-year-old, you know, the first couple of days, he cried a lot. And, you know, whenever he missed my mom, I would call her or message her. Um, The good thing about the internet is that we're still connected. We cannot touch her physically, but we can quickly get on WhatsApp or get on Google and video call her and see her. And so I'm very grateful for that. Um, When I first came here in 2006, that was not available. Like I I think I mentioned when I was calling home, I had to go to the payphone to call home in 2006. So the technological advances and the telecommunications advances here have been vast over a very short period of time. And I'm very grateful for that because even to use the internet, when I was here in 06, we had to go to an internet cafe. I don't know if people even remember those, you know, but we had to go to the internet cafe and wait for that sound, that sound for the internet to load up. And the internet was slow. And now, you know, every home, if you want, can have Wi-Fi. You know, it's available everywhere now. Like we have, like my, I have a Ghana phone. This is my Ghana phone. This phone is a hotspot for six, six users can connect to this phone for Wi-Fi. And then we have another little hotspot that multiple people could connect to. So all of these things really, really help us stay connected. But again, he still misses home. And every day he says he cannot wait until because in, in May we are coming back to the States to visit family and to allow family members to meet the baby. And okay. so every day he talks about, I can't wait till May. I can't wait to see my Gigi. I can't wait to I can because he, he misses um, certain, you know, certain things that he can't necessarily have here that that um, we don't have access to like Hulu. Hulu doesn't always stream here. So it's not that he's missing something major. He's just missing, right. you know, the inconveniences right. <laughs> that 10-year-olds right. enjoy. Um, but I will say this. Our neighbors, we have wonderful neighbors who have children. And the past okay. few days, my 10-year-old has been going out and playing soccer with them. And last right. night, he went and watched a movie with them. And I think that that has been very, very helpful with him adjusting because being around people his own age not just mommy daddy and little brother he's able to really practice autonomy and be a 10 year old because when he's here he's mommy's helper he's big brother he's daddy's helper but when he's with his friends he's able to be a normal 10 year old boy so I know for sure that as he continues to meet people meet young people his age that he will adjust even more um sunday we went to the pool and he was just talking to all of the children in the pool you know and trying to get to know them he's a very friendly child so i you know i don't even worry i don't worry at all i know that he'll be fine and he'll be able to adjust and it's normal and i tell him it's normal to miss home i don't want him to ever think that it's a bad thing for him to miss his grandmother and his friends at home. Um, Because, you know, we were very active in sports. And so his team recently went to the championship and he missed that game. And I know that that made him sad um, because he was able to play all of the games up until the semifinals and they were a great team. So, um, you know, but I told him, I told him that, you know, even though he missed that one game, There'll be games here. You know, he's learning how to play soccer now. 
So I'm yes. like, just like you got to know your teammates on your football squad, you will get to know teammates here on yes. your, you know, your soccer team. So, right, right. And like I said, the four year old, he just, he's just happy to be anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> he is so chill, and he's like, okay, we in Ghana, you know. Yes. I'm excited. <laughs> right, right. Now I know you have older kids as well. Now, how do they make the adjustment? Yes. The older ones. Yes. So the older ones, it was hard for them in the beginning. Um, right. They developed or came up with a little family meeting to talk about how horrible we were for leaving them. <laughs> but they did not include us in the family meeting. And so I thought that was very funny that they had right. a family meeting without the two parents. <laughs> right. But, you know... I also thought it was beautiful that they could come together, even though they were complaining, that they could come together and vent to each other and talk right. to each other about how they felt. And once they got through all of those feelings, then they came to us and said, hey, you know, we feel like you guys are leaving us. We're going to miss you guys so much. And then the conversations and the healing began. We were able to really talk and chat and the education, you know, from the moment we told them we were leaving and, give, and gave them the date, we have been just informing them about Ghana, where we're living, the area, the people, you know, showing them pictures of our house. Our oldest daughter was blown away when we showed her the picture of our house. Because in her mind, again, the perception of Africa, she right. did not think we were gonna be living in a house. I don't know where this child thought we were gonna be moving to, but it wasn't right. a house. So, you know, when I showed her, she was like, what? That's your house? What in the world? She's like, oh my God, it's beautiful. It's huge. And yeah. I'm like, yes, child, there are beautiful homes in Africa. You know, please, yeah. turn the teeth off. Just come visit. I'm like, because you, you're just going off of what, you, what you've seen on the news. But there's so much more than that. Um, and so, you know, we've just been encouraging them to come and visit. Um, even nightlife. You know, we have college kids. And so mm -hmm. I was showing our senior, we have a senior in college who graduates in May. I was showing her a club that her dad and I went to and she was shocked. She was like, wait a minute, y'all were in this club? She was like, where's this club? I said, this is in Accra. This is in the, you know, the capital city. And she just could not believe it. She could not. She was like, oh my God, it looks like you guys had so much fun. Y'all are dancing the music. Yes, you know, we, we had a great time. And so there's so much to do here. You know, there's, you can go swimming, you can go horseback riding, you can go hiking. There's, um, there's a, a brother from the States who has an ATV business. You can ride the ATVs all around. So we've just been showing them and letting them know that, hey, when you come and visit, we're not just going to be sitting in the house. We're going to be out right. and about having a great time. Um, there's a, a huge movie theater here. There's a black owned mall here. Can you imagine a black owned mall? Wow. A black owned mall. Um, so on Friday or Saturday, we're going to go see Black Panther. You know, so okay. we've just been educating our older children on all of the wonderful things that they can participate in when they come and visit all of the educational things, the spiritual things, the cultural things. It's mm -hmm. not just what we see on TV, it's so much more. So. Um, like I said, they they have adjusted beautifully because they knew, you know, we have been talking to them about this for years, 12 years now. We have been telling them, hey, at some point we're leaving, you know, and about I think it was maybe five years ago that we said to them, when y'all graduate from college, we out of here. And so we got one that's graduating in May. So we, we made it close, but we had to get up out of there before everybody graduated. <laughs> right, 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 right. Yeah. So another question is, okay, so you, you've, you've moved to Ghana. Mm -hmm. now, how does, it, how does uh, citizen, citizenship work? Like, do you still retain the U.S. citizenship? Is it dual citizenship? How does that, so, you know? So we... So we still um, we still have U.S. citizenship and we're working towards okay. dual citizenship. Yes, that will come. Um, okay. Typically, that's something that you work towards. You have to show that you are an upstanding community member. They're not okay. just giving away citizenship, right? Mm -hmm. So you don't just come here and say, hey, I want to be a citizen. No, you have to contribute to the community. 
So uh, again, us working and us having our shop will be a way for us to con contribute to the community and show that we're not here to be a burden to the country. We are here to educate others on the beauty of this place. And we are here to help advance Ghana. And so eventually, you know, we will be put on a list and we will be able to receive citizenship. Now, there are other countries um, like Sierra Leone mm -hmm. where you can do your ancestry. You can, um, through AfricanAncestry.com, mm -hmm. you can do your ancestry test. And if you have lineage in that country, you are automatically eligible for the dual citizenship program. So wow. each country is different. You know, and I tell people, I, you know, I hear all kind of crazy things about uh, ancestry tests and people protesting and saying they don't want to do it. And I say, it's up to you if you don't want to do it. But there are things you are missing out on by not having your ancestry. Because oh, wow. there are many, many countries who will give you citizenship just through that African ancestry test. So, oh, okay. you know, you can believe the hype about, you know, the stuff going on your criminal record and all. But if you don't have a criminal record, why does it even matter? <laughs> I'm like, mm -hmm. that's my thing. I'm like, why does it matter if, right. you know, why, your information would not be given to the police anyway? Because you're not a criminal. But mm -hmm. again, whole another conversation. But I, I do encourage people to get their ancestry done through AfricanAncestry.com because mm -hmm. there are benefits. There are many, many benefits. So I, I, I didn't know that because um, I mean I did yeah. did mine several years ago. So you know I have connections in uh, Burkina Faso as well oh, as uh, okay. in uh, Cameroon. So so I have to look into okay. that. You you definitely should. You definitely should. Yeah. I, I actually have done my ancestry through ancestrydna.com, which is mm -hmm. more broad. Um, you know, they, they give you a percentage of where you're from. But right. African ancestry gives you the actual tribe, yep. the name of the tribe, and the country. Mm -hmm. So yep. um it's very, very beneficial. And and it gives you a sense of pride, it gives you a sense of authenticity and a sense yeah. of identity. So, right. I, you know, right. I am a proponent of getting your ancestry done. Right, 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 right. So what's your business? Are you going to, I guess, the, the juice bar, is it going to be in, in the city, like in Accra, or are you going to do it? No, it's going to be near where we live. It's going to okay. be near where we live. So the, our container, our, our business is located in a container. And the container is about, would you say 10 minutes? 10 minutes from here? About 10 minutes from where we live. So okay. we live on one side of the Volta River and our container is on the other side. So we actually have to cross this beautiful bridge to get to our container and our container sits right on the river. It's okay. called the Adomi Bridge. So we cross the Adomi Bridge. And remember those officers I was talking about, those friendly right. officers? We, we pass a group of officers to get to our business. And it's just so funny every day passing by. Well, I'm sorry. Those are the, they are in the army. They're army okay. officers. They're not police officers. They're, they're army officers. But they're very friendly. And they always speak to our sons. They like roll the window down so we can talk to the boys. <laughs> right, right. Um, which is good because we want them to know us. We want them to, to recognize our faces. And right. know that, oh, those those are the ones who sell the ice cream. So that when people right. are passing through, they can say, y'all hot, go get some ice cream <laughs> from, from, from the Rasta family up the road. Right. So, yeah, we cross, the, we cross the bridge over the river and our container sits up on a hill. Um, and you can see the river right from our container. And um, I'm so excited. Uh, my original plan was to open in December. But okay. my husband is ready. He's like, no, we're going to go ahead and start. So um, he's been cleaning out the container because he did a lot of work on the container when he was here last year. He mm -hmm. put bamboo along the walls. Hi, my four-year-old is trying to sneak in. Um, okay. He put bamboo. He can come. He can come and say hello. Right. Come. Can you see? Hi. Say hi. Hey. <laughs> All right. Go back in the room with your brother. So um, he put bamboo on the walls and um, but he hasn't, you know, it's been a year since he's been back. 
So yeah. he just needed to get in the container and do some cleaning. And so he went and did that today. Yeah. And then from there, um, we will start to fill the container with all of our things. Um, I have equipment to make the ice cream. Hopefully we will put an AC in the container. We will paint and do, you know, decorate and have it up and ready by the end of this month. So, beautiful. beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. All right. Also, so, oh, and you were asking about the location. So yeah. the beautiful thing about the location of our container, it mm -hmm. is by that bridge that I was mentioning. But it, it's also along a road that many people travel. Many local people travel that road and many, many tourists travel that road because that road takes you to the Volta region and the Volta region takes you to the waterfalls. And the waterfalls are absolutely magical and mystical here. And so a lot of times when people come and visit Ghana, the waterfalls are on their travel itinerary. So mm -hmm. we are excited about our location because it puts us in a position to be able to serve everyone, right? right? Locals, foreigners, everyone. So mm -hmm. we're really, really looking forward to that. So I just wanted to point that out. You know, the location is very important to us. Okay. Okay. Cool. Cool. So, so for people that, I guess, you know, that are thinking about, you know, making that move or want to get more information about, you know, where can they go to research, um, you know, making this you know, trip to Ghana? Just not necessarily just to go move over there, but just for mm -hmm. a reason. You know, how can people prepare for that? So there are a lot of different things you can do. Um, there are so many tour groups here now, um, mm -hmm. but you can also, um, you can tap into people who have already made the move. Um, we would love to be a resource to anyone who is interested in visiting or moving um, because okay. that's one of our goals as well, to help people who want to come visit, who really may not know how to start, what to do, because you do need a visa to come here. And, um, you know, so we can we can be a resource. We also have other people in the community who are resources. There are Facebook groups that serve as very good resources. For the past year, I have been in a Facebook group just reading posts. Like um, like I was mentioning, I love to bake. And so I have been on that Facebook group learning about baking, learning about, you know, what's the, what's the best type of oven to use? What's the best, you know, temperature to use? Because everything is Celsius, not, you know, <laughs> Fahrenheit. So, yeah. you know, things are different. This is not right. pounds, it's kilos. And so right. just researching. So there are multiple um, avenues to finding out information. Um, if, if anybody is interested in doing like a tour group, um, we know several, several owners of tour groups here that can help with that. And hopefully we will become a source of tours. Um, before we left the state and before COVID, we were actually planning a tour group to come. We had about 12 people who were um, going to come to Ghana with us and we were going to do a 12 day trip here. Mm -hmm. And then, of course, COVID ruined all of those plans. But, you know, it was probably for the best because that just gave us the drive to say, hey, Let's hurry up and get there so that we can help from this side bring people here to experience the beauty of Ghana, not just the city life, because there are people who come here and only want to visit the city. And there is right. nothing wrong with that. But when you only visit one area, you miss out on so much beauty that this country has to offer. Um, I will say when I was here in 2006, my professor took us from the northernmost parts of Ghana all the way to Cape Coast. And you mentioned Burkina Faso. We were able to cross the border into Burkina Faso and walk around. Like that's how far up north we were in Ghana. And then to travel all the way back down and to see so many different cultures and groups of people. It was a beautiful experience. And so I tell people, when you come, you can stay in this city. The city is convenient. But if you want more of the country, if you want more of the culture, more of the people, then you have to travel outside of the city and see more of it. So, you know, if anybody is interested in resources, you know, they can 
link me on any of my social media and I will be more than willing. Um, I have a meeting with the sister in a couple of hours because she's purchasing a home here. And so she was asking me if I would just be, excuse me, a guide for her. So I'll be talking to her in a couple of hours about some things that she can do for her family to ensure that she makes the right decision on as far as location, you know, where she wants to be in, re in relation to the city. Some people, you know, like we're two hours from the city. Some people want to be a little bit closer. Some people want to be in the city. So she and I will talk about all of these things as well as the difference in cost, because that's important. You know, if you come here and you don't want to continue to work the way you worked in the States, then you may not want to live in the city. But if you don't mind, or if you have a business that is bringing in income that can sustain you then go for it, you know, so it's so many different options. So yeah. yes, and there are resources out there. Okay, okay. And I know you've been documenting your, your journey online. Yes. I know you have a YouTube <laughs> channel, right? So, so yes. folks that want to continue, you know, after they see this uh, conversation, want to you know, continue following you on your journey, where can they find you? Yes. So I am on YouTube as um, he Hello Mama Africa, Instagram at Ama Indy, and TikTok Mama Doula Healer. And every day I try to put up content. I am very new to TikTok. Okay. <laughs> so I am um, utilizing my 10 year old to help me with posting on there. But um, yes, I, I try my best to at least do one or two reflections on Facebook where I'm writing kind of in journal style um, mm -hmm. about how our day is going. And that really helps people to follow along with what we're doing. You know, it, it helps family and friends feel more comfortable. Um, my husband and I have a very, very large extended family and we have lots of friends in the state. And so we wanted to ensure that they were able to feel like they were here with us. And so me writing on Facebook every day helps me a lot. It helps me feel like I'm still connected because people are able to comment. And they're able to message me and say, hey, sis, you know, we're right there with you following along where I have one friend who says she curls up in her chair every night just to, you know, to read my post, you know, so that mm -hmm. makes me feel so connected to home and connected to the people that we love and hold so dear to our hearts. Beautiful, beautiful. Now, I also heard you mention there's a book coming out as well. Yes, yes. Okay. So a couple of years ago, um, a book was put on my heart called mm -hmm. All the Mothers, and I started working on it, and then my dad got sick, and I kind of um, just put it to the side, and so I stopped working on it, and since I've been here, um, Spirit has been leading me to focus on that book again, and so that book will chronicle not necessarily our journey while here, that book will chronicle what led me here. And, okay. um, and so it will detail um, just many different parts of my life, church life, my first marriage, being in a blended family now, all of the things that have occurred over the past, uh, however many years it's been since my first trip to Ghana okay. that have led me to this place. So I'm really excited about that. Again, it's called All the Mothers. And if anybody wants to help support with publishing costs, I do have a pre-order link that I will be more than willing to share if anyone is interested. But um, I'm working on that. I have a writing coach who is absolutely amazing. Um, I turned in the first chapter to her. And um, it was just, it was just really beautiful. I felt... I felt so accomplished <laughs> okay. to be able to turn in a chapter and and feel secure, you know, about it. I think one of the other reasons I put the book down two years ago was that I did not feel secure in my writing. I, I'm a very um, self-critical person mm -hmm. and I'm the type that I will write and edit as I go along. And that is not the best thing to do when you're trying to get work done. And so my writing coach has been teaching me and encouraging me to just write, write from the heart, write from the spirit, you know, write in the moment, dictate my words, you know, 
just 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 be in the moment and allow yes. her to do all the stuff that will cause me to not want to continue this process. So <laughs> she's been amazing. Um, and I'm really, really excited about working with her. I've had people who have been ordering books left and right. And I'm like, guys, I haven't even finished the book yet. <laughs> but that just goes to show the level of support that we have. And I'm right. just really grateful, you know, I, I just I can't I can't thank everyone enough because there's so much negativity in the world. There's so much foolishness in the world. And to have people on our side literally lifting us up in prayer and in practical ways, it has been amazing. It has it has helped so much because we are not alone in this journey. But I'll say this, even if we were alone, I would be okay because as long as I'm with my husband and my children, I'm fine. But it really, really does something to my spirit to know that I have people at home who are pushing me forward and encouraging me and, and, and letting me know that, hey, trust yourself, girl. If you can make it happen to get to Ghana, you can make anything happen. And that is the message that I've been receiving from everyone. And it has just been so uplifting to my heart, my spirit, and my soul. I, I think I mentioned homesickness before. Um, I used to get homesick really easily, but I have not been homesick at all because I'm home. I am home. We are home. This is our home. You know, and America will always be our, our home as well. You know, America is our home too. But this is this is our homecoming and we are where we belong. So Beautiful. Yes. Beautiful. Well said. Well said. All right. So if you had one final message to give to people that are kind of on the fence and are unsure, what would you say to, to you know, someone back home or back here in the States that's, you know, contemplating coming over? What would you say to them? Just come. Just come. If the desire is there and, and even if there's fear, even if there's doubt, even if there's anxiety, if you have a desire to come and visit, just do it. And everything else will work out the way it's supposed to work out. You know, there are those of us who were separated from this place. You know, I, I don't discount anybody's native ancestry, but we do know that as people of color, many of us were separated from this place. And it was intended for us never to return. And there are many people who live in other places who have no desire to come to Africa for whatever reason. But if you have a desire to come, it is for a purpose and it is for a reason. And I encourage you to do whatever you can to make it happen. And if you need any type of assistance, encouragement, guidance, reach out to me. You know, message me, call me, email me. I will be that little voice in your head saying, come, just come, just come and visit, come and see for yourself. And, you know, I, I think sometimes people think that it's hard to come and visit, but it's not. It's not. We, we make sacrifices every day for the places and things that we want to visit, right? Right. You know, we save up sometimes three or four years in advance to go on that vacation to Europe for six or seven days. You can take that money and come here for an entire month and get a chance to really experience the beauty of Ghana. So just make it happen however you can. Set, set the goal, set the intention, and work towards it every day. And if you need help, information, let me know. Let someone else know that has been to Africa so that they can encourage you as well. But just come and see for yourself. Okay, beautiful, beautiful. Well, I want to say thank you for taking the time this morning to, you know, to share your story and to inform us of the beauty of Ghana. Because, again, I know there's several people that want to make that trip and kind of on the fence. And I'm sure after watching this, they're going to go ahead and make that first move and make it over there. Yes, I hope so. I really do. And I hope that we can come back and do this again with maybe my husband and my children. 
I would love oh, for, yes. yeah, I would love. Yes. And then also, if we do this again, all of our furniture should be here. So you can Because <laughs> <laughs> right now we have, uh, we have some things that are being shipped to us from the state. And okay. then we have some items that are being made here. So okay. hopefully next time my walls won't be so bare. I'll have all of my beautiful masks and my paintings up and you can see you can see our home. I can maybe show show you around the house right now. We only have a few pieces of furniture as we okay. wait for everything. But um, okay. yeah, I would love that. I would love to show the house so people can see, okay. you know. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. But I know you still have some photos, you know, of the, the, the property and some photos of the house when you, I guess, I think on your Instagram and on the yes. uh, YouTube as well. So Yes. Yes, absolutely. So, yes, feel free to to um, friend us or like us or whatever it's called on all the things. Subscribe. Right. <laughs> I'm showing my age, right? Like all the things, whatever, <laughs> whatever you do on those things, do it. Right. <laughs> like, right. comment, all the things. Please just let us know um, that you're, you know, make your presence known. But I, I would love to connect with people online so that they can learn more about this beautiful place that we call home now. Beautiful, beautiful. But definitely send my send my greetings to to Cujo. You know, I will all, absolutely. You know, and uh, again, thanks again for coming on. You know, for sharing yes. your story. And like I said, again, it was my we'll pleasure. Connect again. We'll connect yes, again. thank you so much. All right, cool. So have a good one. You too. Peace. All right. Peace and blessings. Generation, Generation wealth, 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 wealth.